Okay, so if we take a look at this task uh, number two here about differential mode and common mode voltage at first, and then um, if you check the exercise task booklet, there's also a similar task about common mode and differential mode current. Um, so we will see, we will probably discuss this one more in detail. And then I think if we have some time, we will also do the other one. If not, um, I think you can also try to do this yourself. So we have voltages given, um, namely this unsymmetrical voltage here um, and this one here. And these are the voltages between the forward and the return conductor measured against ground or against reference. And it's two cosine functions. They have different amplitudes. They have different phase angles. Um, and one is even negative. And, but they have, of course, the very same angular frequency because it's like one, one signal. OK, and so then the question is, how large is the differential mode voltage, uh, which is also given here? And how large is this common mode voltage, which is defined as the voltage between this virtual midpoint, let's say, if this is some symmetrical arrangement, uh, like I explained, some low voltage differential signal signaling system, something like this, and the ground. So all these voltages are measured uh, with respect to ground, except for this differential mode voltage, which is the voltage between the two conductors. And so now the question is, how do we calculate this? And if I go back to the exercise booklet, there is some small remark there that says it's expedient to convert these time functions into complex phases, then do this um, calculation in the complex domain, in the frequency domain, and finally at the end go back into the time domain. Um, yeah, and then next task continues. So still Mm, yeah, w w what would you do? What formula can we write down? Uh, what would be a good start or approach maybe with this subtask A to calculate this differential mode voltage here, uh, which is this one? Any ideas? This one. Exactly. So we could write down just by applying Kirchhoff's voltage law, let's say to this loop here, um, we could say that the differential mode voltage as a function of time is just the difference between these two unsymmetrical voltages U1 minus U2 <coughs> as a function of time. And Yeah, you could also write down the, so this is the Kirchhoff's voltage law. Um, so you could also write it down in a different way. Um, if we would, let's say, start from this point here on the top, go to this point here at the bottom. If you go along this way, it's U1 of T. If you go along the other way, it's differential mode voltage as a function of time plus this second voltage. So it's, it's this. Uh, and now if you would rearrange this equation, if you bring um, this one to this side, no, what, what we are, and, or no, if we bring, yeah, if, mm, no, the easiest thing is if we bring the second voltage to the other side, then it will be, we, we will just get this minus over there. Or you could also write it down in a different way, going a full loop. I mean, at the end, we will end up with this equation there. Okay, so this is just um, some some alternative way to write this equation does not bring us any new information. Okay, so yeah, now we could try to insert our time functions here and then we will find out, okay, it's not that easy and straightforward with these time functions because um, they have these different phase angles. If we would just have a plane cosine function, a plane cosine function with the same argument, no problem could just add or subtract them, but not if they have different phases. So what could be the next step then to continue? We can write it into the Euler uh, as complex phase 
exactly. So at first we can just simply rewrite this equation here with time domain functions in the complex domain and say if we have a complex phasor for the differential mode voltage, it will just be the complex phasor of the first unsymmetrical voltage minus the complex phasor of the second unsymmetrical voltage. So if you can write down this Kirchhoff's voltage law in time domain with time functions, you can write the very same Kirchhoff's voltage law down also in frequency domain with complex phasors. This is what every electrical engineer somewhere learns in the, let's say, second, first, second semester, uh, so somewhere there. Okay, so another question is, okay, how, how can we write the first voltage as a complex phasor and how can we write the second voltage as a complex phasor? And if you have in the chat also some ideas or on the stream, feel free to write something there. So what, how would you convert from here into a complex phasor? So, exactly, so we take the amplitude and then exponential function to, with the complex argument j, and then 20 degree. So we, we take some um, stationary phasor, um, no rotating one. So we just take the amplitude and we take the phase. And here we can do the very same, minus 120 millivolt, which is, yeah, not really the amplitude because it's negative, but um, it, it does not matter. It still works in this case. And here we take the 30 degree. <coughs> okay, so just to make this very, very sure, um, so this is not the function of time, at least not from a mathematical point of view. Of course, from some engineering point of view, this is some harmonic sinusoidal cosinusoidal time function. Um, and we describe or express this time function by this complex phasor. So they, they mean the same thing, but from a mathematical point of view, they, they are not the same. Um, so if you somehow write this equal sign, uh, I would always say it's wrong. Because this here on the top, or this what we have here, this is really what happens in time domain, what happens in reality, um, you have a real valued function as a function of time. You can insert any instant of time and for any instant of time, you will get the amplitude of this function. Um, so nothing complex in there and for every instant of time, you get some value. And this is, um, remember what I did in the last um, lecture, the experiment with the oscilloscope, if you measure with some oscilloscope in time domain, there is nothing complex. So like here, if I have our uh, main grid voltage, sinusoidal voltage, if I take a scope, if I measure, is, I measure this, I only get a real part, nothing complex. Okay, so, but this here for sure is something complex because there is this j in there inside this exponential function. And this is not a function of time. There is no time anymore. And that's why this and this, they express somehow the same, but still from a mathematical point of view, they are not. Uh, this is, from my point of view, very important. Okay, so now, of course, we could use this phaser inserted here, use this phaser in, inserted there. And then, yeah, still, I would say, we, we still have kind of the same problem. Now we have two exponential functions with complex arguments um, that are not the same. So still we cannot do plus or minus with them. So, more ideas. Exactly, now we can use this Euler's identity, which is E to J alpha is the same as cosine alpha plus J sinus of alpha. And insert this into this function and then take the cosine of 20 degree, take the sine of 20 degree. And with, with this formula, you can convert a complex number, let's say from this exponential form or from this polar form 
into some Cartesian form. So this Cartesian form means we have a real part and we have some imaginary part. Okay, and of course I don't have a calculator, um, but I have Octave, I have MATLAB, so I will do the calculation and conversion there. So I will write U1, um, capital letter because it's a phaser now for me, and I have a hundred millivolt like this, and then the exponential function is exponent. And I will write one, one J, I will tell in a second why it's from my point of view expedient to write um, one J and then I will write 20. So and I, I, will, I will enter this in a second um, and submit it and wait for the result. But will this be okay? Um, what, what would we expect here for this 20 degree? Um, if you think about what would be the cosine of 20 degree, what should be the sine of 20 degree? What might be a necessary thing to do in such tools like MATLAB, Octave, Python? <coughs> Say again? Yeah, so this exponential function it expects us to insert the, um, the angle in radians, not in degree. Um, and so if we, if we draw a, a quick schematic, um, there's some place over here. So if I draw some imaginary axis and some real axis, so this is for the real part, this is for the imaginary part, um, and if we would draw this, uh, maybe with a different color here, if we would draw this first phaser here, this one, <coughs> into the schematic, so 100 millivolt, okay, this is a little longer, so I might draw this a little shorter, uh, and 20 degree means, so here we have zero degree, 90 degree, 180 degree, and so on, so 20 degree is maybe like this, maybe already a bit too high. So this would be U1. <coughs> and U2, as we can see, has 30 degree, a bit more, but then pointing in the opposite direction. So if I take a second color for U2, here we should get, uh, this should be a little longer and should point in the third quadrant of this Gaussian complex plane. So here we should get, for U1, we should get a, a rather large real part, <coughs> let's say almost something like 100 millivolt and a small imaginary part, but positive. And for the second voltage, they should both be negative. Real part should be, I don't know, minus 90, you no, know, minus something like 100 or so. Um, and, and this imaginary part a little larger, but also negative. So. If we try this with this 20, uh, we see it mm, does not look too meaningful um, because we get much more imaginary part than real part. And so, yeah, this is wrong. So how do we convert the 20 from degree into radians? Any, any idea? Yeah, 2p, two, two um, so 2p radians is the same as 360 degree, and this means p radians is the same as 180 degree, and so this means if I take 20 degree divided by 180 degree, then degree cancels, and if I multiply by p radians, I get radians. So with this, I can convert from degree into radians. And so now we see we get meaningful results. So we get um, almost 100 millivolts as a real part, and in comparison with this, a rather small imaginary part. So this makes sense. So um, here, if I 
try to remember these numbers there. Um, 94 plus 34 millivolts. This is 94 millivolts real part plus J34 millivolts imaginary part. And of course, I can do the very same for the second voltage. So the second voltage is minus 120 millivolts multiplied with exponent J, 1J. Once again, uh, we will come back to this in a second while. This is from my point of view, not the best, uh, not, not the worst idea to write it like this. And then um, as discussed, they are both negative. This is slightly larger than 100 millivolt um, from the absolute value. And this is something like minus 60 millivolt, which would somehow fit to my schematic here, right? Okay, so minus 104 millivolt minus J60 millivolt. Okay, coming back to this question, why it might be a good idea to uh, write 1J and not J. I mean, I can, I can also uh, write it like this and you can see I get the very same result. Um, why is it still more robust or better to write it like this? Who has some experience in MATLAB or in Octave? What, what is the meaning of this J in this case? Complex. It's a complex, um, it's the imaginary unit. It's, it's the square root of minus one. Um, yeah, there's this nice, there's this nice um, joke that I recently read that um, some person says, my, my girlfriend uh, is a real square root of minus 100 and then the other person says what, what does this mean and yeah then the person says yeah she's a 10 but she's imaginary and our relationship is complex so nice mathematics engineering joke there um, yeah so this j means it's the imaginary <coughs> unit and mathematicians write it as i uh, but we already have I for the current, so in electric engineering we use J, so I would work the very same way here. But the problem is, I can also use I as another variable. I can set I to 2, for example. And so now if I check I, okay, I is not I anymore, I is 2. I can do the same for J. And I and J are sometimes or often also used as variables in loops, if you count something and so on and so on. And so now, if I set J to 3, and use this second equation that we used here, just with the j, I, I get something wrong. Because I've overwritten j to be not the imaginary unit anymore. Um, still, if I, use this if I use this equation with 1j, so 1j is always um, the real imaginary unit, the same as 1i, so I cannot overwrite this. This will be always the imaginary unit. And that's why if you want to have the imaginary unit in some equations, it's all typically a good idea to write this 1j because it's more robust. You, you, cannot, you cannot alter this. Okay, so now um, good, a good thing happened. We have this in Cartesian form as real part and imaginary part. We have this in Cartesian form as real part and imaginary part. Now we can, without problems, insert this here and calculate the differential mode voltage. So the differential mode voltage as a complex phasor uh, <laughs> will be just the sum of the real parts and the sum of the imaginary parts. And we can check, okay, the real part is something like um, uh, oh, 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 and now we need to do minus, uh, of course, so <coughs> yeah, we get almost 100 plus a little more than 100. So let's say almost something like 200 and um, 30 plus 60 is 94 something. So this is what we should get. So now if I calculate U differential mode is U1 minus U2. 
then this is the result, 198 plus 94, uh, approximately. 198 millivolts um, plus J94 millivolts. And this is, of course, what I could also try to sketch here in my schematic. If I want to have minus U2, I, I would just take the U2 and how, how does minus U2 look like in this phasor diagram? If you have something and if you if you write a minus in front of it, what, what happens in in graphically in this um, complex plane? It goes, to the it goes just in the opposite direction. So if this is U2, like our equation here, and if I would just write it or draw it in the opposite direction, this would be minus U2. And so now if I want to get U1 minus U2, um, I just take this arrow or this phaser and shift it at the end of this one. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but let's say like this. Yeah, or I could also use the green one and move the green one to the end of the blue one. And so the sum of the two, mm -hmm. the sum of the two exactly will be our differential mode voltage. And, yeah, and so now we would see, okay, this somehow fits if, if this have been a hundred millivolt. Yeah, so, uh, um, approximately these dimensions here fit. Yeah, if you have nice paper with um, millimeter squares on them and if you have a sharp pencil and so on, you could also solve these, this problem here just by drawing it very exactly. No, no problem with this. Okay, so now the question is, um, oh yeah, how, how would you continue? <coughs> What would what would be the next step or the remaining step? Use the result of UDM. Say again. Use the result of UDM. And yeah, what what do we do with this result of UDM? What, what do we want to have at the end? At the end, we once again would like to have a time domain function, and the time domain function has some amplitude or magnitude and phase inside some cosine functions. So we started with cosine functions, went into frequency domain, into complex domain. Now we would like to go back into time domain. So what we, what, what we would convert back to exactly, we would need to convert back into Euler form. So here we would convert this back into some magnitude and E to J and some phase angle. So how, how, how do we do this? How do we get magnitude and how do we get phase? We do the absolute of the... We, we do the absolute value of our complex phaser to get, the to get the amplitude and how do we get the angle? <coughs> yeah, we could write down some tangents formula. So the, the, the angle is, is always this angle here measured in counterclockwise direction from the positive real axis. And so we could check the magnitude. If this was 100, um, it should be a little more than 200 millivolts. And the angle, if this one was 20 degree and this one was 30 degree, the angle should be somewhere in between. Let's say 25, something around 25. And um, yeah, so <laughs> my schematic here is getting a little dense, but um, this is the real part here. And this is the imaginary part. And so, and this is our angle here, alpha. So the tangents of alpha <coughs> is the same as if we look at this triangle, it's the same as what? Mm 
Uh, yeah, but uh, in uh, general, you have you have the real part. This is the real part, and you have the imaginary part of some complex phaser. So, from the imaginary yeah. part and the real part, how can you calculate imaginary, imaginary uh, part number. divided by real part? Exactly like this, because tangens is the same as um, also sinus of alpha divided by cosine of alpha and we see okay the imaginary part corresponds to the sine um, the real part the real part corresponds to the cosine and this is some yeah very general formula let's say in this case and with real part and imaginary part i mean real part and imaginary part of this complex number there's not enough space to write it down here okay so then let's go back into Octave and maybe oops, move this up a little bit. Um, okay, so I, wh what I could do to calculate um, our absolute value now is I could take this here and, I, and this is the real part of my complex phaser. This is the imaginary part of my complex phaser. So if I take real, the real part of this, I get this value. If I take the imaginary part of this, I get this value. <coughs> um, so this fits. So And if I take the real part of our phaser, square it, plus the imaginary part of our phaser, also square this, and then finally take the square root of this. So wh what formula have I used now? Mm. Pythagorean theorem, exactly. And so this should give us the, 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 the length of this line in our triangle. So this squared plus this squared and the square root of this is, is the length of this. And so as discussed, we get a little more than 200 millivolts, 219 millivolts. So I can write this down. And of course, there's a simpler way to do this. Um, as someone already mentioned, we can just take the absolute value or the magnitude of our differential mode phaser, and this will do the very same. Just calculate the magnitude of this complex phaser. Okay. and. So then if we think about the phase, um, we discussed that the tangents of this angle that we are looking for is the imaginary part divided by the real part. So we, I can take imaginary part of our complex phaser divided by the real part of our complex phaser um, and then take the arcus tangents of this, the inverse function. And I get some angle. Does this make sense? What I need to do with it? This is radians, so we need to convert into degree. So how do we convert radians into degree? We divide by pi or by pi. <coughs> and so then it's, let's say, unitless, but we want to have degree at the end. So we multiply by 180 because 180 degree is p radians. So now we get 25, 25.5, let's say. And this, we discussed before, somewhere makes sense because this angle here should be 25, some, somewhere in this range. 25, 25.5 degree. Okay. And so finally, with this, um, we can write down our differential mode time function. And this should be 219 millivolts times cosine of omega t <coughs> plus 25.5 degree phase shift. And this is really milli here and not nano. Okay, in a different way, um, just to go back to the Python thing here, is that there is, um, like the absolute value that we used, there's also some other command that gives you the angle, and it's called angle, and angle gives you the angle of this. 
and yeah, also this angle you need to multiply with 180 divided by p uh, or in, in, uh, do the same conversion in, in, in the other order, but then you will also end up with the 25 degree. <coughs> okay. Um, what, what questions do you have so far? Mm. One thing that I would like to discuss is if we, if we go one step back and if we would like to calculate the angle of this voltage U2 here, so this angle. I mean here we said it's 30 degree but here it has some negative amplitude. We could also write it with a positive amplitude and an angle that is larger than 180 degree or that is somewhere in the range between 180 degree and 270 degree. So um, yeah, Let, let's, let's try to do this. So if we check the, 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 the imaginary part of our second voltage, U2, then as discussed, it's negative. If we check the real part of our second voltage, it's also negative. Now, if we use this arcus tangens formula, and if I just change the formula from the differential to, uh, mode voltage into our second unsymmetrical voltage, and calculate the angle using this formula. Oh, and we get 30 degree. And interestingly, if I take the angle formula and do it for the very same voltage phasor of the second unsymmetrical voltage, oh, we get minus 150 degree. <laughs> uh, even even so something else. So what? What it calculates us now is the angle going here into the opposite direction. Um, okay, but any of these angles I could I could add or subtract subtract uh, 360. So here here with this formula we get to the right result of 210. What we said between 180 and 270. But with this formula before with this one here we get to the wrong result. Why is this? Because we didn't take U2 as negative. Yeah, because it has to do something with the sign. Because this is negative, as we discussed, mm -hmm. and this is also negative. And so something negative divided by something negative is like positive. And so this arcus tangens formula calculates us um, the, the, the angle of the positive phasor. Or the problem is that the tangents, um, you can only calculate the tangents of, or you, yeah, no, 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 not like this, but um, the, the, um, the range of the arcus tangens function is only between minus 90 degree and plus 90 degree. Um, so this formula will only always give you the angle from here to here, only in the, in the, in the right half of this complex plane. So of course, if we take this result and let's say at 180 degree, okay, then we also get the, the right thing. Um, and we need to add 180 degree because the real part is negative, because we are in the left side of this complex plane. Um, so this is also some problem with this arcus tangens formula. Let's say sometimes it works if your phasor is on the right side. If it's on the left side, then you have to add or subtract 180 degree. Um, so once again, this angle function is more robust. This will work in any case because it automatically checks is the real part negative or not. Have you? Have you ever thought about, or have you ever heard about this function here? Arcus tangens two. So if we check what this function does, um, then 
it tells us. So this also computes some arcos tangents of y divided by x. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the, the it, it, it takes care of the signs of y and x to check what is the quadrant of the resulting value. So if we use this function, um, so instead of arcos tangents, right? I, I, at first, let me let me delete the 180. So this was, let's say, the wrong result. But if we use arcos, arcos tangents two, and instead of the division, use a comma because this is the first argument. This is the second argument, and recalculate it. Okay, then we get the right answer. We get the right result. Okay, um, yeah. So when when doing this conversion back into angles, take care that you select the right angle. And so this should be our result. Okay, um, I think. Yeah, more, more more questions, more comments, ideas. So um, then let's just take a second color and do the same stuff with this common mode voltage. So how can we calculate the common mode voltage? For example, um, so we, it's, it's, as you can see, it's a little bit like the, the average value or the mean value um, of the two unsymmetrical voltages. It's just an average voltage. This is mean. Um, and we can write down the very same thing also with phasors. So it's the first voltage plus the second voltage and also divided by two. And then we can do the same thing. Um, yeah, and, and you could also, of course, say if you, um, if we say th the voltage from here to here just across half of this um, load resistance or load impedance is half of this differential mode voltage. And so if you would take the second voltage plus half of the differential mode voltage, um, then you would also end up with the very same formula. You can check it out. Or if you say uh, here, of course, also at the top, this is also half of the differential mode voltage. So if you take the first voltage, and do minus half of the differential mode voltage, you also get the same common mode voltage or the same formula for the common mode voltage. Okay, so then we can just um, go back to Octave and say, okay, the common mode voltage is the first voltage plus the second voltage and this divided by two. Then we get this as real and imaginary part. Say again. Yeah, but this is now already in millivolts. So th this is now very small. We can also, we could also see it on a schematic here. So if I take U1 plus U2, I would end up somewhere there. And then just half of this uh, is, is something very small. So the common mode voltage, do I have some space here before writing in my camera window could fit? So the complex thing, and once again, the, the phaser and the time function uh, expresses the same, but is mathematic from a mathematical point of view still not the same. So, but we have minus, let's say minus five millivolts, minus J, and this one is a little larger. This is 12 or 13 millivolts. And of course we can rewrite this in the, in the polar form and take the absolute value of this. So the absolute value is 
8 or maybe let's say 14 millivolts and the angle of this common mode voltage is minus 111 so it's yeah as discussed it's also pointing in this third quadrant of um, our complex plane so 14 millivolt times e to j minus 111 degree and then finally of course we could write down our common mode common mode voltage as a function of time is 14 millivolts times once again a cosine function of omega t minus 111 degree so the common mode voltage in this case is rather small the differential mode voltage in this case is rather large and why is this because our first voltage and the second voltage the two unsymmetrical voltages are almost equal in size but they have also an almost uh, 180 degree phase shift um, because we have the same angle here and here but but this is negative negative some some um, if you invert the amplitude it's like a 180 degree phase shift okay so this would be uh, the result of this exercise task what further questions do you have there's one Over two, okay. Um, so the common mode voltage is the voltage between this midpoint and ground. Yeah. And so if we set up some Kirchhoff's voltage law, for example, in this loop here, mm -hmm. we would get that the common mode voltage, right? If we go from this point to ground along this way, it's directly our common mode voltage that it's the same as if we go along this way and along this way we would go half of our differential mode voltage plus the second voltage so u2 um, as a function of time plus our differential mode voltage which we have written down over here and now divided by two because <coughs> we just have half of it so u1 minus u2 um, and then divided by 2 and so yeah if you do it like this we have half of u1 and a full u2 minus half of u2 gives half of u2 and that's why it's like this and if you would do it the other way around um, and let's say you have um, yeah u1 minus you could also do u1 of t and then minus this term and then you would also get the very same because this minus and this minus would turn into a plus and so on yeah and, and that's why this formula is like this it's yeah and you could also interpret this as set as the, the the average of these two voltages okay more questions So what I would also maybe like to demonstrate in this case is if you, if you remember back what we have initially written, our differential mode voltage is just the difference between the two voltages and the common mode voltage is just the, the average of these two voltages. And the, the yeah, the, the main reason why we have taken this detour here, let's say, yeah, because we just we converted into frequency domain, then we did the, the um, plus and minus there, and we converted back into time domain, was that it's, it was a challenge, and it, it is somehow a challenge to say we want to have this cosine function minus this cosine function because they have different phases. So, but if we have a tool like MATLAB, like Octave here, 
Um, of course, we could just calculate this one here. We could just calculate this one there. So then, then it's, it's not a function anymore, it's just numbers. We calculate, we just calculate this time function, we calculate this time function. And we have just numbers. And with the numbers, we can, without problems, do plus and minus. So this would be a different way to, um, um, to solve this problem and still to get how large is the common mode and differential mode voltage. So what we would like to do now is calculate a small u1, really a time function. And for the time function, I will still use, okay, 100 millivolt multiplied with cosine of omega times t and then plus 20 degree. And of course, the cosine function also wants to have the, the angle in radians. So also here we need to, uh, how do we convert from degree into radians? <laughs> Divided by 180 multiplied with p. And if I press enter, of course, this will fail because I have no omega and I have no t. So how could we do define omega? is two times P times F. So if I enter, of course, this will fail because we have no F. <laughs> so what do we take as F as the frequency? 50. For example, we can use 50 ohm, no problem. So uh, 50 Hertz. So we have 50 Hertz. So then we can calculate omega. It will be this 340. So now if I go back to my time function here, it will still fail because we have no time. So how can we define time? <coughs> <laughs> and what, what would be a meaningful time range to look at if you have some sinusoidal function or some cosine function? Yeah, one, one full period of time because then we see a full cycle of our signal. So uh, how do I get periodic time? Yeah, it, 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 in this case, it's 20 milliseconds. But how could I calculate the 20 milliseconds out of what we already have there? We have, we have angular frequency and we have frequency. We want to have periodic time. Uh, no, no, not really. So, something like this. So how is the frequency defined? How is frequency defined of a signal? One over, the one over the periodic time. So if we have the frequency, if we want to have the periodic time, one, one by f. Right? So if we do one, one over f, then we get the 20 millisecond, which makes sense for our 50 hertz, um, for example, main street voltage. OK, so now I still need to have time points. And I would like to have time points over one full period of time. Um, and it would probably be a good idea to have them linearly spaced, right? To start at zero, to end at capital T, and to have 100 points maybe in between, um, or 101, because then we have one for the, for the, for the beginning and one for the end, um, linearly spaced points. So how, how do we get them? You want it? Yeah, we, we could do something with the spacing and say we start from zero and then do steps and then end up at T. And so I could do steps, for example, like if I want to have a hundred uh, points, I could do something like this. Um, so I would put some semicolon at the end to escape the result. But then if we check, if I make this a little larger here, um, so then you can <coughs> somewhere here in between see there is our T and for the T now I get 101 points and they have this spacing, um, which somehow makes sense. There's my command window back. And I could also do the, so if I, if I output the 10 first values, <coughs> 
Let me see, okay, I get something like this. Looks meaningful. I could also do the same by using this command. Lin space gives you a linearly spaced vector from 0 to capital T for the periodic time. And if I want to have 101 points, um, you can see now I also get for T 101 points. And if I output, oops, if I output the first 10 values again, I get the very same thing. So, okay, now we have omega, we have t. Uh, we could go back to the formula that we had before, u1, just from our exercise booklet. And I will also escape the result, but now it calculates something. Now it's, now it's probably meaningful. Uh, we can check this in a second, and we can do the same with u2. And U2 has minus 120 as the factor before and 30 degree angle. Okay. And so now as a test, I could plot them. And plot these two voltages into a joint diagram. And it will look like this. And it probably looks meaningful. Um, maybe we can also add some grid. And if we would be real engineers, we would also label our axes, but we have no, uh, we, we, we omit this. Uh, for, for, for brevity of time, we now know, okay, this is the time. No, we should probably do it. We say uh, x label, this is time in second, and on the y axis, we have voltage in volt. Okay, and the first curve is the blue one. So this is our, you can see uh, exactly 100 millivolt minus 100 millivolt first voltage and 30 degree, no, 20 degree phase shift means the, the, the first maximum, which would be usually at zero degree is shifted 20 degree into this direction. And so this one here has 120 millivolts of amplitude it's negative and so the first, um, let's say minimum here is shifted by 30 degree into this direction over there. So this, yeah, somehow makes sense. And of course now it's quite simple to say, okay, our uh, differential mode voltage, so we just use the formula that we had written there on the top the differential mode, mode voltage is just the, the difference of the two. No, no, no problem here. And the common mode voltage is just the average of the two. So u1 plus u2, now these time functions or the values of these time functions is not really a time function anymore. Okay, and we get this and I can plot them, add them to the very same plot. So say T and then UDM. And we can check now we get the, uh, now I know all my settings are lost. Uh, okay, so now we get the third curve, which is this orange one. And we can add also the common mode voltage. And then we get this last very small curve. So U1, U2, differential mode, common mode. Um, we could, yeah, go back um, and, and, and also add the legend. So if I do this grid once again, an X label and Y label, and then I think we could also do a legend and in the legend say uh, U1, U2, then U, differential mode, and U common mode. Okay, and there we have a legend. I don't know why it's so horribly small. Uh, no one can read this, but th there it is. Um, okay, so this would also be some, some way to somehow solve it. Uh, but now, of course, the question is what is really the amplitude and phase of this new functions. If you, you now have just a bunch of values and if you want to know how could I write this back into a formula, um, yeah, you would need to have some cursor here probably 
and find out, okay, what is the amplitude of this function and how much, what, what time and what angle is it shifted um, against some reference to, to check back. How could I write this common mode and differential mode voltage like we did in back into a time function with magnitude and phase. Um, still, what we could do, and this is maybe the last thing um, that we can discuss for this task, if I set up a second figure, so I have, I have a new empty figure, and this, in this empty figure, I will plot as a function of time our differential mode voltage that we calculated in time domain. And so we could also plot our differential mode voltage that we calculated in frequency domain. And the, the, the magnitude or the amplitude of this was, if you remember, this was the absolute value of this complex phasor, right? I can try to move this up a bit. So this was the magnitude. And now we would need to have a cosine function of omega times t and then plus our 25 degree here. And how did I get the 25 degree? Angle. angle. And it was the angle of uh, our differential mode voltage phasor, complex phasor. And in this case, um, this will give us the result in radiant. This expects the angle in radians. I don't need to do any conversion there. Um, and close this plot function. And so now we should get two curves in the plot. We should get our differential mode voltage directly calculated in time domain, and we should get our differential mode voltage calculated in frequency domain and then plotted back into time domain in, in, in the second diagram. So here is the second figure. And so now, okay, you see two, you just see one curve, um, one red or blue, or maybe two colors on top of each other. I don't know. So if, if we zoom in there a little bit, uh, how can I zoom? like this one. Yeah, so I see, okay, these curves, even if I zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, they, are, they, they look like exactly the same. So they, they probably are. Let me close this plot once again and open it up once again. And I will just, um, for better comparison, make the second function a little smaller, just scale it to 99%. And so then if we check the diagram, and if I make it a little larger, and now if we zoom in, yeah, we see it's, it's really two curves which are very close to each other. Um, and they just have this difference that are uh, artificially introduced with this 99%. Yeah, and so we could do the same grid uh, stuff and X label and Y label there and uh, get also a nice plot for the second diagram here with our differential mode voltage. And of course we could do in a third plot, uh, do the very same and take our common mode voltage that we calculated in time domain and compare it with the common mode voltage that was ca calculated in frequency domain um, by plotting, converting the complex phasor back into time domain and also add a grid here and an X label and a Y label. So, and then there is our third plot. And now you can see that also for this common mode voltage, which is much smaller now here in range, if you could, if you would be able to read these numbers, I don't know uh, why they are so small, but um, I'm also using a rather old version of Octave. Maybe I should update because I think the current version is nine or 10 or so, it, it fits. Yeah, so what we did in time domain is the same as we did in frequency domain, but there are many options um, along this way where something can go wrong. Um, you can do something wrong, let's say with the angles, if it's radiant or, or degree, um, with the signs over there, with this conversion, with the arcus tangens formula, um, so, yeah, this, this way here of 
comparing the pure time domain result with the frequency domain result is a nice check um, that this really works.